Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Open Source and Business, a speaker series where we explore a broad range of topics related to the impact of open source on, on industry at large. Uh, today, we have an episode on how inner source can accelerate culture change in your organization. And uh, this episode will be hosted by my colleague and friend, Leslie Hawthorne, who currently leads the vertical community strategy team at Red Hat in, as part of our open source program office in the office of the CTO. Uh, crafting Red Hat's engagement with vertical related industry consortia. Um, thank you for joining me, Leslie. And uh, I guess I will let you take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you could join us today. I am honored to be joined by two uh, longtime friends and uh, distinguished technologists, Denise Cooper and Isabel Drost from. I'm going to go ahead and let these wonderful folks introduce themselves, and uh, then we'll go ahead and jump into our. Uh, questions on inner source practice. Denise, take it away, please. Hi there. My name is Denise Cooper, and um, I've been involved in open source for a really long time. But for the purposes of this discussion, you should know that I'm the founder and current chair of the Inner Source Commons Foundation, which is a nonprofit set up to promote and, and share education about the inner source method. Thank you. Isabel? Hi, my name is Isabel. Um, I'm a member of the Apache Software Foundation and also a co-founding director and president of the Inosos Commons. I also am open source strategist at OHIT, which is a company in the financial space located here in Berlin. Wonderful, thank you. Um, all right, so I thought that the best way we could start off our panel discussion today was with a bit of a level set um, because not everyone is completely familiar with the term inner source. Uh, so I would appreciate it if we could get a brief overview and sort of an understanding of how long the practice has been around. Sure. So um, the term inner source was actually coined by Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly Publishing, O'Reilly Media, back in 2000. And at the time, he and Brian Bellendorf, who is the co-founder of the Apache Software Foundation, had just started a for-profit company called Collab.net. And its mission was to teach people how to use open methods inside proprietary companies. Um, so they were trying to teach the Apache way inside because they believed that it was a better way to engineer software. But unfortunately, in 2000, open source was not yet the household word that it is today. And change initiatives always meet with resistance, of course, in established organizations. And it was far too easy for the people who wanted change not to happen to push it aside because they could say this is never going to fly. And that actually was pretty likely back then. So um, in 2014, there was sort of a admission that open source had won in the industry. There were a number of articles that that claimed that uh, Satya Nadella started running Microsoft and, you know, immediately said, hey, we're not going to fight open source anymore. We love open source. And so that was seen as a big change. And um, I was taking a new job at PayPal to help them uh, with their open source engagements. And when I got inside the company, I realized that they really needed to learn about collaboration before they could form reasonable projects and give them to open source. They'd done a successful one uh, around Node, but it was an edge group. It wasn't in the middle of the company. And my, my charter was to help the middle of the company. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 2015, in March, I got on stage and started talking about InnerSource again. <laughs> um, so that's where it comes from. Um, awesome. Um, Isabel, do you, would you would you be so gracious as to give us the thirty thousand foot view of inner source for those who who are not as as versed in the topic as Denise? So I came to the movement much later than Denise, um, and like on a side channel, it was back in two thousand and eight in Amsterdam at an Apache Con that I heard a talk about bringing the Apache way of decision making into companies. So ever since I tried to establish that with my own team, um, tried to combine open source best practices with agile best practices and to make teams and to enable them to be more remote first and to be more asynchronous. It wasn't until 2017 that I came in, in, involved with the inner source commons. Like then essentially it was a group of people interested in that topic from various backgrounds. There were academics, there were open source people, there were of course Apache people. 
um, but they all, were also regular corporate people interested in crossing organizational boundaries. And over time, this group of people grew. So we decided to incorporate as the Innosource Commons Foundation early last year before the pandemic hit. And the goal essentially is to provide educational materials. There are patterns where if you have a certain problem in your team, you can go look for the for a list of patterns and see which one addresses your current challenge and apply a proven solution to that. Um, there's online training, there's books, uh, but to me, the most important component of this group is um, the possibility to discuss challenges and team challenges in sort of like a safe environment. We operate on a Chatham House rules. That means that whatever is discussed can be shared externally, but you have to cut away the affiliations because what we want to facilitate is for organizations to chat their chat about their challenges and about their problems and to be very open about um, which kinds of issues they are facing but we want to be able to share the solutions more widely that's why we want to give people the option to not share their affiliation but to share the solutions of course so essentially the goal for the entire community is much like what I know from the Apache Software Foundation. It's about bridging organizational boundaries because the challenges that we have in the financial sector, if you look into tech teams, there is the same that you have on other companies as well. So why should we all work on isolated solutions to these um, issues, but instead collaborate together and move much faster in solving them? Excellent. Thank you very much. So uh, in my own experience uh, with working with different uh, companies in, in various industry verticals, I have seen uh, InnerSource uh, gain much more traction in even just the past few months. So uh, for example, the FinTech Open Source Foundation has just created uh, an InnerSource working group and lots of their members have already joined and started participating. So I, I think what I'd like to do is bet my assumption um, that we're seeing increased interest in InnerSource lately. And if, if that is a correct assumption, what do you, to what do you attribute that change? Well, you know, all stardom is not instant, right? We've been working pretty hard for the last six years. So it's good that we were ready when, when everybody got interested. Um, the Finos thing is an interesting one. Um, I don't know if you know or remember, but back at the beginning of the rise of Linux as a viable business solution, the most important thing that happened in, in the year 2000 was that IBM um, announced that they were putting their own brand on, in, on the Linux bandwagon, essentially, and that they were going to spend a certain amount of money um, making Linux work for them. And Intel was doing the same thing. And the first group that actually adopted Linux after all of that happened was the fintech group. And specifically, it was the big trading houses initially because they didn't like spending money on boutique software and hardware, more importantly. And they were uh, convinced by a consortium of companies that represented the um, x86 chip and its instantiation in boxes that they could create supercomputers within their shops using one new systems that were going to be chained together and using this new operating system called Linux. And um, in the same way, they're looking at Intersource and realizing that it, it offers an opportunity for them to rearrange the way that they do engineering to be more responsive because younger fintech companies are eating their lunch, just like, you know, Google ate uh, Alta Vista's lunch, right? It's, it's a succession of companies that understand about quick iteration, some of which they're borrowing from the open source community. But big brands like banks cannot afford to wobble in the public view. And so they need to educate themselves about how to do this kind of collaboration before they tackle really big open source projects. Some of them have dabbled in open source and found it quite challenging or it's been at the edge of the company and it isn't penetrating back into the core. So I'm not surprised that they're so interested. Um, we have a slide that we like to use when we talk about InnerSource right now. And almost every major bank that you can think of is on that list. They're already dabbling with it. 
So, so setting up a special interest group at Finos is just a way to meet them where they already were, right? There are already operating agreements within Finos that make them feel safe. And Chatham House Rules is working quite nicely for us over at Intersource Commons, but it's a, a bit to swallow if you're a bank and already super nervous about your brand equity, right? Absolutely. So, so I think that's why you're suddenly hearing about it. But, you know, it's not just banks. We're see, on that slide, there's also communications companies, there's um, media companies, there's, there's, of course, all the big tech companies, but there's also, you know, surprising other industries where people are finding it useful. And it seems to be, this, this is kind of the snowball year, I think. I, I would agree. Uh, Isabel, what would you like to add? Um, I think that I would like to take that up with the snowball year. Um, the pandemic was a very bad event for everyone, but I believe it was a very good event for those who prefer remote, working remotely. So everyone suddenly had to prepare themselves to make decisions asynchronously and was everyone working from home. So I so just looking at the teams that I work with at OOPs, what we've seen is that we started getting into InnoSource three years before that event started. Um, our goal essentially originally was to cross silos, um, was to make teams that before were striving to work independently to move a little closer together so that they could rely on each other. Um, but suddenly, as everyone had to work from home, everyone realized, wait a minute, the things that we've been practicing for three years helps us right now to move faster. And helps us right now to make the switch much more smoothly. Essentially, it was was the push of a button. Within three days, that our entire workforce switched from being in the office mostly to being at home 100%. And at least for engineering, there was no disruption. More to the point, it was that we got feedback from our customers that we were working or that we were moving much faster than they had expected. And in some occasions faster than before. And that is something that can be enabled by training these best practices and by moving to this working model before already. I mean, let's face it, open, like software right now is nowhere being built from scratch. You always have to rely on, on other technologies, on other libraries. But if you look at it more closely, you do not rely on technology, you do not rely on libraries, you rely on different teams and you introduce the dependencies between these teams. So as soon as you need a change to be made in such an upstream library, you can go to that team and put it in their backlog, like you always used to do and then wait for the fix to happen. Or you can work around it, essentially re-implementing functionality, or you can go the inner source or open source way and provide the patch yourself, or at least provide help. It's not like a as fast as if the team would have made that change right now themselves, but you remove all the waiting time. You still have to go through mentoring and you still have to do some learning and training, but it's much faster um, than waiting until suddenly your priority goes up. So I believe the pandemic here was kind of a catalyst for us this way of working. Excellent, thank you. Um, so, Denise, I think this, this question actually speaks to your to your statement about the many different places where you see intersource practice taking place. Um, is there any reason why intersource would be particularly exciting to specific industry verticals? And I'm asking this because I think uh, intersource is appealing to companies that are operating in highly regulated spaces in particular, but curious for your views on that. Well, let me let me say first of all what the why companies are finding Intersource useful because we have a list. We have, as um, Isabel said, we have patterns that we've collected and you know gone through a standard pattern describing uh, regimen to create them for people to use in Intersource Commons. So we're seeing you know evidence through case studies of the reasons or the benefits that people get out of it. So first of all, it can be used to dismantle silos, 
that are caused by excessive ownership. There, there was a move about 15 years ago in engineering that said, if I make you the owner of this code, then you will have pride of ownership and that is gonna be good for the code base. And um, that movement has kind of, I believe, gone about as far as it can go without starting to really impact organizations. So um, the silo one is the main reason that people should join, but there are other reasons. Uh, reducing engineering bottlenecks, even if you don't have silos, if you have engineers that are waiting around, that might be because they can't scratch their own itch and Intersource you know, allows that. Um, of course, you get an automatic bump in quality. I don't think I've talked to anybody who can't say that they got that. And that's just because you're actually instituting real code review. Because in, in organizations where velocity is the main vector, you find that code review becomes just a rubber stamp pretty quickly. And that's of course not good because code is hard to write. <laughs> and then um, sometimes people in, undertake it to get to healthy code reuse. So whole groups of organizations are implementing um, continuous integration and deployment right now. And it's a perfect example for people to start looking at, um, at code reuse because nobody wants, you know, as many of those as there are groups in the company that you want like one to manage. And, uh, and so that's, that is driving it a lot. Then there are organizations that have used it successfully to create a, a culture of innovation where one didn't exist before just by breaking the pattern and letting like-minded people, inventive people work together um, in ways that maybe the original culture wouldn't allow. Um, it also makes employees happy, which we know because we see it. Um, it increases the, re the retention of new college hires, new recent college grad hires, because they're expecting more agency than they typically are given in old fashioned engineering organizations, but it's not necessarily safe to give that to them. So giving them a way to be mentored in that makes them feel like they're part of the whole company and not just one silo um, tends to really increase their happiness. And then it creates actionable documentation that can really increase velocity. And, and right now we're working on research projects that can measure exactly how much increase in velocity you can get because there is a cost up front to adopting this, right? Um, but the last one and the most important one for us here is that it increases the likelihood that if you do open source, it will actually be successful. Because I know um, from when you were consulting Leslie, you've seen companies waste a lot of brand equity and money and time launching open source projects that nobody cares about or that they can't, they can't penetrate so there's no community. And one of the things that Intersource does is teach you how to do that. So the kinds of verticals that are interested in it, I know there's right now because of the FinTech thing, there's a, th there's a thought that it's really good for regulated industries. But I don't see those regulated industries walking away from open source because of their regulation. In fact, Deutsche Bank 15 years ago broke ground by saying, look, we're a regulated industry, so we don't want to own this, this horizontal asset that we hope everybody will use. We want it to be in the public. I think that's already pretty well understood. Mm -hmm. What's not understood is how to build a community, how to behave as though there's a level playing field. And, and um, I think it's, there's so many industries that have that problem. Yeah. Right. That's very fair. Isabel, your thoughts? So I believe that for many companies, even if they are using open source, they have trouble getting into those projects and contributing back, just simply understanding how the process works, how the communication works, mm -hmm. um, how the creating a patch, submitting it works, and how the patches sent back uh, behind the scenes being treated and modified and reviewed. So I believe what many companies learn sort of like internally with inner source is how that process works and that enables them to easier, in an easier way to um, become involved upstream. So that's like another motivator in, in addition to the cross the silos enable asynchronous decision making. Also for larger companies, um, what I have seen is how to make decisions across multiple time zones. Like as soon as you have a team or have people that have to synchronize, which are located in Asia, in Europe and in the US, you have to come up with a different communication pattern that is not, let's hop all in the same 
even if it's just a video call. It just doesn't work if someone's sleeping. sleeping. Okay. Very good. Uh, I'm going to take a quick pause on questions for my esteemed panelists just to let folks know who may be watching the live stream that uh, we will be taking questions from our chat. So please do drop those questions into chat and I will be reviewing them uh, after a couple more questions to our panelists. Uh, and we have some other uh, additional questions after that that uh, we'll be discussing, but we obviously want to hear from the audience. So participation, welcome and encouraged. Thank you. Um, so I think this, is, this may be the million euro question. Um, so I have I've often heard the critique that InnerSource is, is not sufficient. Um, because what it does is it encourages companies to enjoy all the benefits of open source software without ever contributing anything back upstream or to the community or to the open source projects uh, that they're that they're using behind their firewall. Um, I welcome thoughts on this idea. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think um, this this rumor has been floating around for a couple of years. Um, came out from the free software movement feeling that somehow we were conspiring against them by teaching this. And I think it's hard for companies that are already woke to open like Red Hat to really understand how deep the problem is outside of the cool kids um, to understand how to collaborate at all. Right. So this is my experience is once they engage with open source and I sorry with inner source and clean up their internal engineering a little bit and see how everything flows and where it works, all of a sudden they start coming up with reasonable ideas for open source projects that might actually fly if they then, you know, build community behind it. And I don't see that beforehand. I mean, you remember that I was a consultant for five years. Yeah. I had the best possible consulting arrangement in the world because Tim O'Reilly was tired of talking about open source and he just sent me all of all my clients and I had amazing clients and most of them got great outcomes, but there were a couple that had every reason to figure it out and get it right. And they could not get out of their own way. And that made me think, wow, there must be something I'm missing here because this isn't that hard, <laughs> right? But when I went and looked at who it was and where they were coming from and the kinds of reactions they were having. So for instance, I worked with a company, um, very famous nonprofit that um, was taught by its original corporate ownership that as ambiguity increases, you must tighten control, which is exactly the wrong thing to do if you're trying to build an open source community. As scary as it is, you have to let go. You have to allow for unintended consequences. And if you've been, if it's been drilled into you that the way to success is through control, you're going to fail, right? So finding, using enlightened self-interest as the way that we catch them and get them interested in fixing their own stuff is a sneaky way to get them to understand why they would want to join this world movement. And in fact, when I was thinking it up, I was thinking, okay, there's missing tooling here. Some of them are gonna write tooling. If we can convince them to open source the tooling to the inner source community because they don't wanna to have to maintain it by themselves, uh, you know, especially if it hooks into existing tools, then you know, how great would that be? And that tricks them into doing open source and they get all the benefits right away from the center of the company. And, and um, so, I think, first of all, that it's paranoia to think that that somehow companies are going to be so content working inside their own firewalls that they're never going to work outside. Even Apple finally figured out that they needed to open HealthKit and WebKit or it was never going to get adopted. Right. What will happen is there'll be slow erosion of the fortress mentality. But the early adopting or let's say middle adopting, because there is a whole bunch of tech companies that already figured this out under their own steam because they, they weren't so ossified in their approach. But if we get middle engineering interested in working this way because it's more efficient and it makes the employees happier and um, for all the good reasons, right, then what, we get a lot of benefit out of that. And um, we can go back to this question when we get into sustainability because <laughs> I, I have another reason. But um, this was absolutely my motivation in the first place, was to help these companies that are lost find their way because they're not finding it on their own. 
Yeah, I, I just, just to interject, I, I frequently tell folks when we consider questions of, you know, how we can get people to be active in open source communities when they haven't been before, pointing out that we now live in a world where documentation on how to do open source the right way is ubiquitous. If everybody was going to figure it out on their own with what we have already put out there, they would have done it already, right? Every, you know, we are, we are not the only smart, smart, cool kids, right? You just need to meet people where they are and help them to to find a different direction potentially. You want you want to hear a cute little factoid. Um, I the first always book, want to hear your cute little factoids. The first little book that we did, which I think you were at this OSCON the first time it I was. talked about it, we had a little book called Getting Started with with Inner Source that is 26 pages long, and we gave it out from our booth and we gave gave away copies, you know, also at the at the keynote, and. Today, that little booklet is the most downloaded non-code asset at public GitHub. No, the most, crazy. which tells you that InnerSource is having a moment, <laughs> right? It's it's a it's the kind of book you give to your boss. You know, it's like an executive summary book. <laughs> but um, but it's really popular right now. So everybody wants to. The, the whole industry is yearning to make this change. And we'll get to a question later where I talk about why I think that's critical for open source. But right for right now, that's what I have to say about the, the rumor that we're bad. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, ma'am. Over to you, Isabel. What would you like to add? So much like Denise said, um, there are people who know how open source works. Um, I'm really, really lucky in that I had the pleasure of joining an Apache project right out of university. So to me, this kind of collaboration and all the technology around it, that's, that's the most natural thing in the world. So mm -hmm. for years and years, for me, it was completely incomprehensible how it could be so tricky for my fellow engineers to just submit a tiny little patch. It's easy, right? Except when it's not. So what I had to learn the hard way is what it seems like a natural way of collaborating for me is really, really hard for professional developers all around me. And for that, I have a tiny little story for you to share. I do run Berlin Buzzwords here in Berlin, which is all about open source, search, etc. And there was a time when Apache Hadoop was extremely popular. So we had an Apache Hadoop hackathon. During the hackathon, we had Hadoop committers, that is like project maintainers who know how things work. We had a few university students, but we also had many, many professional software developers. So at the beginning of the day, we set up a flip chart where we collected ideas of what we as a group could work on, like in breakout um, groups or as an entire group. After collecting all those ideas, we made a vote among all of the attendees what we should really be doing because we couldn't do all of the projects and like with a large margin, the most um, popular item on that list was show me how contribution works from all of the attendees. So I was extremely lucky because one of the um, Apache Hadoop committers had getting started issues right at the top of the set. And getting started here really means something extremely simple, like fixing a typo in Javadoc. So you can't break anything by, there's no way. So what we helped these attendees go through was um, where to figure out how to get the source code, how to make the change, how to compile the project. At, like at least back then, there were several different tools that you could use to build a Java project, same today as well. And then talk them through how to generate the patch, how to submit it, and then explain what happened in the background, like how automated review works, um, which which um, committer will look at it and review it, and then how it's integrated into a final release. Now, granted, today a lot of the tooling has been kind of like streamlined. If you look at GitHub or GitLab, submitting like a pull request is kind of easy. But still, when I talk to my colleagues who are using open source on a daily basis, and I tell them, hey, look on the mailing list if you want to figure out X, like, okay, where do I find figure out where I should subscribe. Oh, there are archives for that. Oh, you can search them. Oh, you can search them back for 20 years. <laughs> and what again is the URL for finding these archives? And only then you realize that, okay, that is a lot of knowledge 
and a lot of tribal knowledge that we have acquired as a community over 15 years, over 20 years, that other people who haven't been into open source, who may very well be extremely good engineers, who have no clue how to find that, and who have no clue how where to find that, and who don't understand how to follow what we do on a ba daily basis. Now, if they don't find us, they won't be able to contribute back upstream. Um, one experiment that I did was with a, with a former colleague, and which I also recommended to friends of mine, was someone, someone was coming to me and again asking the question of how do you get involved. Uh, I have like a, a one day of time that I can dedicate. And like there's not a ton of things that you can do with one day, but check out um, which project you use on a daily basis. Go to their communication channel at a particular mailing list. At some other project, it can be a GitHub um, flow and see what's being discussed there. It won't take more than two to three weeks until you find yourself um, active in that community, answering questions from others. And that's already an extremely valuable contribution. And only from that, continue scratching your own niche and fixing stuff. It's not like you dedicate one day and that's particularly helpful, but look at what's on your desk already and get involved with these. Mm -hmm. And that's basically in order to do something like that, you need uh, a certain set of arguments in order to convince your own people manager to give you the time to do that. And interestingly enough, the same arguments that you use in InnoSource in order to cross team boundaries, they also work as soon as you want to contribute back up to things. So you learn not only technologically, but you also learn to argue for that case to get that time. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, all right. Uh, last question before I go and check for questions in the audience chat. Um, so if InnerSource is a useful pathway to help organizations that have not uh, historically participated in open source projects, um, what are some best practices that we can share that help companies be best prepared to eventually move into open source engagement? Right. Well, <laughs> the first one, of course, is figuring out what's keeping you from doing it now. And we, we in, in the inner source world, we call that a cultural inventory. Um, I did kind of write a 12 step based version of these, <laughs> of these rules because it is like making a change in your own life. Right. So first of all, realize that that it's something that you need to learn and um, start looking around for opportunity. And we advise inside of companies that they first find a couple of interested parties that have good motivation to work together, but don't for some reason feel like they have cultural permission and give it to them, right? This is why it's nice if you work out of the CTO's office or somewhere where you can cut through the middle management where you need to cut through a couple of things. First of all, pushback that is designed to keep change from happening, right? Which everybody who's worked in a big company understands what that feels like. But also you need to deal with people who may have everybody's time very, very carefully accounted for. Because sometimes that pushback is actually, you know, accounting pushback. And then depending on what's going on within the organization, you might also have to turn the executives off. That's, that was something we described in that first book. And that the group that we were talking about was motivated because they realized um, they had 65% of their time, every sprint, every two week sprint, was spent responding to executive escalations rather than to planned work. And that was really disheartening for them. So turning that spigot off was really important. <coughs> Excuse me. So then once you found a pair that get along and you know would like to be able to work more closely together then you have to negotiate uh what's called a contributing md doc that helps them understand how they're going to get over e their fear of each other there are certain fears that i find in traditional organizations over and over again sometimes they're in different different arrangements but it's really common for the owner of a large transaction silo to feel like the UI engineer that's trying to submit a pull request is a lesser engineer. That's very common. It's also really common for the, the person trying to be the submitter, the contributor, to feel like he's not gonna get heard and it's not gonna be faster. 
So you have to mitigate those fears. In the case of PayPal, initially our contributing MD gave the silo the right to ban any individual contributor who was wasting their time. But they had to go through us to, to do that. They couldn't just do it themselves, right? But they could tell us this person is wasting our time with some evidence and we would do that. Interestingly enough, they never actually used that, but they wanted the right and we gave it to them, um, you know, so that they would feel comfortable. And then on the other side, the, the contributors wanted to know that if they submitted a pull request or a request for information, that they would hear something back in some reasonable amount of time that was quicker than the feature request path, right? And they, we gave them that. We got the other side to agree to us uh, SLA, service level agreement. We were surprised that they agreed to 36 um, business hours after, after announcement. Yeah, it was really fast. We were surprised. Um, and they, but they were motivated, right? And then they, they got into working and everything that could possibly go right in that project went right in that first project that we that we found we were very lucky that way but we also found some known tendencies so for instance people who have been under crazy time pressure unrealistic time pressure will always optimize for velocity even if it's an ill-formed optimization so they would come back to us and they would say, we've decided that if we get a story point that's, you know, a tiny fix that's only one or two story points, we're just going to write it ourselves. We're not going to mentor people. And so then you have to tell them about, you know, teaching people to fish versus fishing for them. You know, you're going to be stuck forever if you keep doing that, right? And I promise it's going to get better. And within two or three sprints after resisting that impulse, they found that they had advocates they had trained on the contributor side who could work with new contributors and relieve them of some of the burden. But then they also had the captured documentation of the mentorship that they did with those initial contributors. And that also gives new contributors a leg up. That's where all your velocity comes from. And um, so, so we tell them, do a small experiment. Try to make sure that everybody is really motivated to get it right. Notice what impediments exist in the culture. In, that, in the case of that particular experiment, it was all blown up at the end of the day by the fact that um, we'd forgotten about the product owners and their role. We were doing it engineer to engineer. We knew about the bosses, the cheeses, but we forgot about the product owners and how when they switched to Agile, they lost a lot of their, their jobs because now it was all about stories. It wasn't about feature articulation, right? And they weren't very good at writing stories that the engineers could understand. They were all, they were getting rewritten in engineering terms pretty consistently. So they were feeling disempowered and having this last thing where they got the bosses yelling at each other <laughs> was one step too far. They felt really, really like they had to stop us and they were successful at stopping that experiment, ending it. And then we knew we had to factor them into the next experiment or they would keep doing that, right? So you learn a lot about your culture from that first little experiment. And um, that's the first best thing you can do. Very cool. Isabel, what best practices would you share? So I would also concur that it's good to start with experiments. Um, I would add that if you start with experiments, you don't obviously don't start in the void, but you look at where the challenges of that organization is and start to phrase you know, the solutions in terms of those challenges. That makes it much easier for the team to buy into what you're trying to do. And likely it helps to have on the, those first experimental teams someone who knows how open source collaboration works and someone who, who can translate, look, this is how it works at Apache Project X. And we will try it out right now here. And we will um, do a retrospective like in two, three, four weeks' time and see how it works giving a team like this time horizon, we will try it out for X weeks and then adjust. And we will provide a certain time slot where we look at it again, um, already helped to a great deal to get buy-in because they knew that there is an end to these experiments. Often what we did try, of course, was successful, but it helped to get, give the team like a pass out. Now, I have another um, reason for writing a contributing document. It's not only to deal with fear of those people, it's also 
to do a certain kind of expectation management. If you submit a patch and you expect a response within six hours, like you would do if you go to the desk of your team member, that's not going to work very well. But if you wait for 24 hours and you don't receive even a, yes, I've seen it back, that's also not very nice. So what we've done is to set a fairly small um, time frame to get first response back. It doesn't have to be like I've integrated this fix. It doesn't have to be, yes, it's merged and released, but only just, yes, I've seen it. I will get to it, say, tomorrow. That is something that we can expect within a business day or two. And that already helps a great deal. And it's also something that I have seen in successful open source projects. The patch itself, until the fix is made, can take several days, several weeks, sometimes even months. But typically, projects are very quick in giving feedback, like, I've seen it, I'm on it, or I've seen it, I will be on it whenever. Mm -hmm. And something else that I've seen is that people start fearing that everyone has to do the same thing or follow the same rules. Um, like the entire bike setting discussion of which um, coding rules should we use or which check, st check style rules should we use. And there, InnoSource essentially with the contributing document gives you a nice way out. You tell people that not everyone has to do exactly the same thing but at least you have to write down what you do. What is your contribution process? What is your time until you respond? Not everyone has to respond within 24 hours, but you at least have to make it transparent what your expectation is and what your contributors' expectations should be. So that helps with um, getting teams better aligned. So it's easier to go from one team to another or make contributions to different teams without teaching those teams to do everything exactly the same way. So it's kind of like a middle path there. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. So I have, uh, I have checked our chat and people are sharing some excellent resources. Uh, first of all, if you are interested in learning more about Intersource Commons, we suggest that you head on over to intersourcecommons.org. And from there, you will find a learning section where you can download the book Denise mentioned on uh, getting started with inner source. So go ahead and check those out. Uh, and Dave has also, our wonderful convener, has shared the link to the open source and business YouTube channel, which I am not going to share with you because it is a very long URL. However, search functionality is your friend in this case. And we hope that you will check out some other episodes from this series. Um, I'll go ahead and keep monitoring the chat for incoming questions, but in the interim, I'll go ahead and uh, head on to what I think is the 2 million euro question, which is, um, does it really matter if a company never participates in open source communities and instead focuses only on inner source? Okay, so I come at this from the Apache point of view, right? Um, back in the day, the free software community was into compelling um, the people to give code back, right? Compelling contribution through licensing. And um, Apache was founded on what's called permissive licensing, which uh, they didn't invent, but they embraced wholeheartedly. And among the things that it does is it allows companies to make use of the code without giving anything back. There's no requirement to give anything back. Uh, there are, are some rules in the Apache license about what how you use the trademarks and um, what the patent impl implications are of you joining the community. But there is nothing about you know, needing to give code back because you've used the product. And on that basis, um, Apache is, I know Linux is considered the most successful open source project, but the Apache web server has got to be up there number two or three because for years and years, a majority of all web traffic passed through an Apache server because IBM picked up that server wrapped it with IBM good, goodness and called it WebSphere, right? So um, the install base is crazy for that software, right? So we believe that companies that get involved in open source will figure out on their own that it makes more sense not to freeload. It makes more sense to give your changes back because you don't want to have to keep backporting them and maintaining them. So private changes don't make a lot of sense in you know, horizontal markets, basically. And we run everything that way. 
So we're not troubled the way that some people are about what's now called the maintainer problem. Around the time that I started talking about Intersource again, um, Nadia Iqbal, the researcher who at the time um, was at school, but then she went to GitHub right away, uh, put, put out her first paper. And of course, now there's also a book that she's recently written. And one of the things that she believes is that the freeloader problem is sort of the problem of sustainability in open source because the maintainers that she's meeting are tired and underpaid and thinking about quitting. And we know that the heart bleed problem was born out of um, maintainer fatigue, essentially, right? So, uh, so is it problematic that we have, you know, un unvetted groups of individuals maintaining things that we all depend on and sometimes they get tired and shouldn't we be injecting money into the situation? And there's even some efforts to legislate that through licensing, that so-called ethical licensing movement or ethical open source movement where they want to actually break open source to save it, right? Um, so this is what I have to say about all of that. I think that open source is inevitable. We, it won a long time ago. It's table stakes now. Everybody has to have a policy about it. That's why all the tech companies have already gotten there. And what we're seeing is the long tail of everybody else who produces software showing up to try to figure out how to fit in, right? Um, and I think what we really need is more maintainers. We need a lot more maintainers than we have. And we need a lot more maintainers than we're gonna build in the normal course of educating new crops of engineers. We're not gonna get it out of code camps. We're not gonna get it from the kids who are inventing new open source projects because they're fundamentally inventors. They're not maintainers. That's part of the problem. So where are there a lot of maintainers? Well, there are a lot of maintainers in traditional software settings. There's tons and tons of them. There are people who have been in those salt mines for whole careers. And most of them do never get to work in open source. And we know how much joy open source brings us, how great it is to work in open source and how much they could get done if they would, you know, lend some of their time and energy. And there are increasingly, you know, people get paid to work in open source. So there's plenty of people willing to put money up for maintainers that will help shore up this problem, right? Or this perceived problem. But where do we find them from? Well, I think we find them from the ranks of existing engineers. And we get there by teaching them, by convincing the companies that this is a better way to work in, in the large, because it is, and that their, current, their future workforce is gonna demand this kind of work, which they will, help them get there early. The ones that figure it out and get there early will have that first mover, in this case, second mover, but first in their industries, advantage that allows them to continue to innovate and build their own path while feeding the supply of people that are prepared to work in open source. And then demand will take care of the rest of it inevitably because there is demand. There just is no resource. And even smaller and vanishingly um, rare resource is people who know what the three of us know about how to build this kind of effort, how to build a community around something um, all of that stuff is, is sort of antithetical to the way that proprietary for-profit companies have optimized. And all of that's going to have to change. The ones that don't pick this up will probably fail. If you look at the uh, Fortune 100 over the last 20 years, you'll find that the people that were listed 20 years ago, most of them not listed right now. <laughs> and the people that replaced them are all people that know how to work this way. This is the future. We're just trying to help you get there faster. So I think this is actually key to the sustainability of the open source movement. And I realize there's a leap of faith for people who um, like the Free Software Foundation who feel marginalized already and see this as just another example of corporations taking over their lunch. But we can't, we can't reasonably expect to continue to scale with the available resources we have. We just can't. I, I'm willing to agree with, with Nadia on that, but I don't think it's because we're not spreading the money around. I think it's because nobody knows how to do it except us. And it's, it's time for us not to be a club anymore. And this is one of the ways I can think of to get there. Very good. Isabel, what would you like to add? I think I would like to add two more perspectives. Um, a, more and more companies are starting to use open source, even in the regulated industries. Now, if you buy a software package, you want to understand 
um, how that package works, not only on a technological level, but also in terms of how it's maintained and who is behind it. You want the same knowledge with the open source components that you build your system on. Like if you build your business on top of open source, you need to understand what's underneath. If, even if it's just in order to make it an educated decision which component to use, like which database is going to be around for the next five, six, ten years, which kind of data processing system is going to be around. And the three of uh, the three of us know that this is not only a technological position, but that there are business and community factors that you have to take um, keep in mind as well. Now, if you build your business on top of the software, I believe you have to have some understanding as well, and that's why you have to get involved upstream in order to have that understanding how these communities work and how these projects work, and in order to understand where money comes from and where influence comes from both those projects. And for that, you have to be very close to these projects. In addition, if you look at um, what the what open source projects can achieve. What I see is an extremely high speed of innovation. If you look at the streaming projects, if you look at third, if you look at data analytics, there have been multiple companies standing together to solve a very a complex problem, problem together, and they have been extremely fast. So if you do not want to miss this train of innovation, you have to become involved upstream. You have to collaborate with other people. But something that I have seen and something that I have found very fascinating at Apache is seeing companies that in reality are competitors mm -hmm. work collaboratively on their common source code, on their common base fabric, and essentially collaborating in order to um, rise faster and higher together. Now, if you do not participate there, I believe you will move out. And that's why I believe it's in the company's best interest to become involved in open source and to move beyond inner source. Inner source gives you the tooling and the teaching that you need in order to be successful. But I believe it's just the first step. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so we are nearly at the top of the hour, and I think uh, additional questions would probably take us over time. So I wanted uh, first to thank Denise and Isabel very much for their time and sharing their insights with all of us. It's always great to spend time with the two of you. Um, any quick closing remarks that, that either of you would like to make are most welcome. Sure. Um, I would like to say that because I live in Europe now, in fact, all three of us live in Europe, um, Europe is going through a great flowering of open source right now. Uh, just today, the, the um, France has um, signed a, a statement that they plan to invest heavily in open source going forward. And some of us have been involved in the movement to help Europe to this conclusion, right? One of the things that is different about Europe to the US um, and we know this from a recent study, is that in Europe, most open source is uh, contribution comes from relatively small companies. It's not the tight, the titans of industry, it's the small companies. Um, we have been involved in an effort to try to get more involvement from academia and municipal government in open source. And in almost every case, we start out giving them inner source pointers because they're stuck in the same way, exactly the same way, that older organizations are stuck. They have different motivations, they have different outcomes they're looking for, but they need to know the basics so that they feel like they can engage. And it reminds me of the ocean and people, people contemplating diving into the ocean without ever having been taught how to paddle or how to swim, right? It's a pretty scary idea until somebody takes you by the hand, floats you for a while, shows you you can float, shows you how to use your body to move in the water. That's all inner source is. But it's always with the eye of getting to that ocean. And to me, the ocean is open source. The ocean is, is the obvious place to go. It's the only thing that will keep us from the crazy nationalist tendencies that we're seeing in the world right now, because all the boats have to rise. So as we're talking to Europe about their, their open source engagement and they're using words like digital sovereignty, we're saying, OK, that's not possible what you could do is become technically independent but you cannot do it in such a way that the boats around you don't also rise that's that's how open source works and it's kind of blowing their minds that this might be global 
<laughs> and not local. It's really interesting to watch. So, you know, it's a deep topic. And, and once you get people started, they fall into it and come out in some very surprising places um, that are gonna be better for everybody. So thanks for giving us an opportunity to talk about it in this context of, of open source and business. And for companies that are curious and feeling like open source is, is that ocean that they want to get into very much so, you could come and try your water wings out with us. That's what the intention is. Excellent, thank you. Isabel? I would like to conclude with an invitation. Um, everyone who thinks that InnoSource is something interesting to them, come over to the InnoSource Commons Foundation. Join our Slack channel, we are open. Um, share your challenges, share whatever solutions you have found. Um, what I find extremely interesting about the InnoSource Commons material is that at Apache, I've learned a lot of things by doing and by watching over the shoulders of other people and by seeing what they do. At InnoSource Commons, I see for the first time that this is written down in a way that it can be consumed by someone who's not an expert because it's phrased in this kind of pattern format where you have an, like a challenge that you want, want to address, you have a solution and you have a description of, of what you will find afterwards. So I find that very nice for someone who wants to get started. Great, thank you. Uh, well, uh, once again, thank you very much for your time. And Dave, I think it is time for us to hand it back to our fabulous convener to tell folks a little bit more about the Open Source and Business Series. Thank you very much, Leslie. And uh, thank you for uh, hosting this fascinating discussion of, of, of inner stores. Uh, thanks, Denise and Isabel, for joining us this week. Uh, next week, uh, we will have um, Dr. Chuck, uh, so for those of you who are familiar with open source, the name may ring a bell. It's uh, Dr. Charles Severance, who was one of the founders and the um, initial uh, executive director of the Sakai Foundation. Sakai is a learning management system for um, a massive online uh, the MOOCs, massive online. I think it's massively open online courses. Something like that. Yes, thank you very much, Leslie. And um, uh, uh, he has written a fascinating book about the early days of the Sakai project, um, which is linked in the in the session discussion. And we're going to talk about um, those early days, the the growth phase of a user driven open source community, and the tensions that arose in the Sakai community, which I think lessons can be learned by other projects, at the point where uh, vendors started to commercialize that project for for um, for other uh, customers and users in in, the, in that uh, vertical. And uh, so we're going to have a, a chat about that. Um, it's going to be a trip down memory lane, uh, but it's also, I think, going to provide some useful, um, useful lessons on the commercialization of open source projects that come from user communities as opposed to uh, projects that are uh, that are open sourced by a software vendor. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And then the week after that, we will have Stephen Wally and uh, Jeff Borek. Uh, Stephen from uh, Microsoft, Jeff Borek from IBM, uh, revisiting a topic that they have discussed in the past in person in events. Uh, open source is not a business model. So we're going to have a fireside chat style debate around whether open source is a business model or a development model or a distribution model or all of those things and, and kind of dig into some of the nuances of, uh, of creating an open source um, business plan, if nothing else. Okay, so thank you all for joining me. I look forward to seeing everybody in the future. Uh, if you have not yet signed up, we do have a newsletter so that you can stay aware of future speakers. This session will be going up on YouTube uh, soon after the, the broadcast. Uh, it, it takes a little bit of time for me to download and edit and whatnot, but um, either today or tomorrow, the session will be on YouTube. And uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you all uh, again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Isabel. Bye, Dave. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.